Thank you, uh, Durgalila, and everyone for hosting this event and inviting me to come. It's a real joy for me to be here and participate evenings and mornings in this satsang, where I live in uh, Owen Sound, Ontario, which is a few hours north of Toronto. I don't have a, a satsang like this, you know. I do sadhana mostly by myself, and I teach yoga, but I'm just so grateful for all of you in maintaining this space, maintaining this vibration, maintaining this beautiful frequency um, for all of us consistently and for those who come. And that we know that this also is creating this blanket of peace that extends to the planet through the sound current and the, um, the holiness that you've created here. So deep gratitude for all of that. I want to share a little bit about my personal history and then I'll talk more about the Beyond Addiction program. I uh, grew up in Ontario. My mother was a nurse who started to drink alcohol when I was four years old. We had a terrible car accident. She went through the windshield and never really recovered from that. She had damage to the frontal lobe of the brain, but that was never um, articulated at that time. She was in a mental institution for a little while, and I didn't know where she was when I was four. It wasn't explained to me. And my father was a, um, an immigrant from Poland who had uh, fought in the Second World War for the British. And unknown, unbeknownst to any of us at the time, he suffered from PTSD, had these out, outbursts of violence. And, and I grew up in that, in that. and I, I became a fairly, a really very functional person, excelled in school, um, graduated with honors from everything I did. And I didn't realize till many years later that I had grown up with trauma and that it had had a deep effect on me. As a child, I, I remember trying to desperately help my mother stop drinking. And it felt as if it was my responsibility to do so. I remember calling certain uh, agencies in Toronto and seeing if they would admit her. And the, and the information I got was, no, she has to make this telephone call herself. So that childhood, you know, was a blessing in so many ways. And I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have so much passion about helping people and helping with addiction if it hadn't been me uh, spending that time with the parents that I did have. So I find it very interesting and I have immense gratitude for all of the roles we play lifetime after lifetime. And I came to appreciate my, my mother, even as an alcoholic, recognizing that in this lifetime, if that's the karma she chose, it allows, allowed me to be what I am. Without that, in, in, in many ways, it was her sacrifice, actually, of living that sort of life that allowed me to have the deep um, sense of purpose that I have now in being something different. So each generation causes a shift in the generation that follows. When I was a child, my mother used to uh, wander the hallway. We lived in a very small house. She would wander the hallway at night with the light on. She would come into my room where I had a bed with my sister, and she would wake us up, and she would say, how do we pray? How do we pray? And she had this existential angst. She really wanted to know, how do we pray? And at that time, there was not a... There was nothing that fed her spiritually. So I came to realize early on that, that, uh, that it matters that we have a spiritual practice, that we have that connection. And then it's, when it's missing, there's great sorrow, great sadness, great loss, great loneliness, and a hollowness inside. So when I was 19 years old, I, I was graced to um, meet someone who practiced Kundalini Yoga. I was able to meet Yogi Bhajan. And in my 20s, I practiced an awful lot of kundalini yoga and taught a lot of it. And 10 years later, in my early 30s, I recognized that that practice really allowed me to clear a lot of the emotional debris that I had picked up as a child. And I, I had a deep desire to help others. Um, and I was asked... In around 2006, because I, had, I knew Kundalini Yoga fairly well, I knew a lot of the Kriyas and the meditations, I had already written three books on women's health and breast health, and I was good at creating curriculums. I was asked if I would put together a curriculum on addiction recovery, because when Yogi Bhajan came to North America 
1968. That was one of his um, great causes. He really wanted to help addicts because he saw that that's all they were looking for. It was, the, it was the late 60s, and LSD was around, and marijuana was around, all the drugs were around, and he saw it as a spiritual lack, that they were just looking to get high on spirituality, and, and they didn't have the tools to do it through yoga and meditation, so they used what they had. And so that emptiness is what he addressed by bringing uh, kundalini yoga to the West. So when I was asked around 2006 if I would put this curriculum together, I had to stop for a minute and say, well, do I really want to do this? It's a big job. I had just written through three books. I knew that it would take me at least a year to put it together. I knew what sacrifice was entailed in terms of it meant less time with my family, less time with my kids, less free time, no television watching. <laughs> it would take over. You know, writing a book is a full-time job. And it did. But... What inspired me was, again, going back to my childhood and thinking, I need to do this for my mother because I couldn't help her. She died as an alcoholic, and, uh, but I could use that pain, actually, and transform it into something positive and useful, which I did. And I'm happy to say that now that the treatment center in Toronto that I called to ask if my mother would, would be able to go there when I was about 16 years old, someone now is teaching a simplified version of the Beyond Addiction program there, teaching Kundalini Yoga in that center, and that made me feel so good that, that I had an impact, you know, many years later. So let me just explain a little bit about the Beyond Addiction program. So it's a 16-module program. So we offer it either as a nine-day intensive with a 16-week follow-up. Uh, that's that's in, people meet in small groups on Zoom once a week, so that the uh, we form a community and there's support for at least four months. Usually, it goes on longer than that. And each of those modules has a theme. For instance, the first module, the theme is I am a spiritual being having a human life. The second module is I live by my values and virtues. The third module, the theme is I communicate from my true self. And these themes are, are somewhat based on the teachings of Yogi Bhajans. They're affirmations that, that empower us, inspire us, that we remember, um, that remind us of who we really are. And each of the modules also has some um, personal work to do, some process work to do on ourselves as well as in small groups. Each of the modules has also a pranayam, a kundalini yoga kriya, and at least one meditation. Sometimes there's two of each of those in a module. And we ask people to, to practice whatever they can of the, of the pranayam, the yoga set, the meditation, each week to decide if they want to practice for three minutes a day, 11 minutes a day, 31 minutes a day, two and a half hours a day. You know, it's up to the individual to decide, depending on what their background is, how much time they have, and where they're at. You can't push or force. Everything has to be very gentle as an invitation rather than a must. Otherwise, there's resistance. And currently, uh, we've trained a number of trainers in the Beyond Addiction program. It's offered in Vancouver, in Toronto, in just outside of Los Angeles. In Florida, we're going to be teaching it in Hungary this summer, or this fall, with Dr. Gabor, Gabor Mate um, participating. And it's been taught in Chile and South America and Mexico and uh, Ecuador. And along with that, I've had to create an, an international organization to sort of oversee this. And that's been ch a challenge for me because I had no experience with that. But um, it's working very well. So I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about, about addiction first and then um, to give you some practical experiences from some of the Beyond Addiction modules. Let me just open my computer. So basically, the definition of addiction, and this is a definition that I've um, hijacked from Gabor Maté, he says, it's any pattern of behavior where you crave something, you find some temporary relief or pleasure in it, you're unable to give it up, despite negative long-term consequences 
of engaging in that behavior. And those negative long-term consequences would include to yourself as well as to those people around you in your lives. So let's just go through those points again. So it's a craving, some kind of craving. So consider your own addictions as we go through this. What do you crave? There's some sort of temporary relief or pleasure in it. What is it giving you? So this is always a question we need to ask, is what is the behavior giving you? It's relieving something. If we're going to fix it or heal it, we need to know why it's there. We wouldn't be participating in it if it didn't do something for us. So what is it doing for you? And that also takes some of the shame and the guilt away from it. What has it done for you? What is it doing for you? We're unable to give it up, and it has negative long-term consequences. And there's a couple more pieces that are important in understanding addiction. So that's kind of the surface definition of it. But under, er, underneath every addiction is a belief about oneself. And Scott talked about this a little bit yesterday. And there's a perception. And underneath that, there's a feeling that's usually unconscious. And the feeling is often sadness, anger, or fear, or shame, or confusion. Sadness, anger, fear, shame, confusion. These are the feelings we don't want to feel because they're uncomfortable, they're painful. So we need something to relief, give us relief, and that's the addiction. And there's a perception, and the perception might be helplessness, or hopelessness, or I'm unlovable, or um, I'm not good enough. Those are perceptions. But underneath those, what's, what's the feeling underneath I'm not good enough. Probably sadness, right? Or maybe fear or maybe anger. But that's what we want to identify, acknowledge, and kind of hold space for with acceptance and compassion within ourselves. We have to really come to terms with what happened to us when we were children that caused those feelings that we buried and caused those perceptions that run our lives as unconscious beliefs and often drive the addiction. If I look at back at my own childhood and my addictive patterns, my addictive patterns are to work and to sweets. When I'm under stress, I go for sweets. And when I, uh, well, I just work a lot. <laughs> um, so if I look at why do I work so much, what's the perception. What is it doing for me? What's it doing for me if I work so much? I would say there's a sense of accomplishment of achievement. It gives me a sense of self-esteem. I use work to justify my existence because my underlying belief is I don't deserve to be here. Does anyone else recognize that underlying belief? I don't deserve to be here. And so we work and work and work or do things to kind of justify our existence and get some sort of reward. What's the reward? Every addiction has, there's a, there's a reward. What's the reward? Achievement. Other people value me. I have a sense of value. You get it? So we have to really dig deep with every behavior and see underneath it, what's the belief? What am I getting from it? And what's the, what's the feeling that's really deep? And that feeling that's really deep for me would be sadness, very deep sadness that I hardly ever experience consciously. Because what did I do as a child to mask that sadness? What did each of you do as a child to mask the feelings that you couldn't express, that no one held for you? So we all adopted coping mechanisms. So one of mine was to be cheerful. So that cheeriness masked the sadness. And I remember even report cards that I got in grade school, grade one, grade two. Always cheerful. Cheers others up, you know? And I, I generally, I would feel that I am a happy person now and perhaps always have been, but it's difficult for me to express sadness. And it shouldn't be. All the emotions, ideally, should be fluid. If I'm sad, I should cry. If I'm angry, I should get upset and shout, you know, and then it passes. But if there's an emotion we can't express easily, 
If I'm afraid, I should be able to say I'm afraid, I need help. If there's emotion we can't express easily, then it's emotion, an emotion that got suppressed, that wasn't held for us when we were a child. And then we diverted that to some sort of coping mechanism to keep us, to give us some sort of relief. So in my own case, it was that cheerfulness. And another perception I had as a child was that I was, was helplessness. So in terms of dealing with my family and my violent father and my alcoholic mother, I felt helpless. And I didn't realize that consciously till a few years ago that my desire to help others is a cover-up for the helplessness I felt as a child. So the only way I can feel good in t- or relief, gain relief for that perception of inner helplessness that's unconscious is to help others. When I make that perception of helplessness conscious, then that desire to help others is no longer an unconscious driver and codependent, but it's a conscious choice and healthy. You see the difference? So we have to dig deep under addiction to see all of these underlying beliefs, the feelings that are hidden. And then once we have them is hold compassion for them, accept them as they are be with them, allow them to be as they are. And then they, because that's what didn't happen for us when we were kids, no one was there uh, to say, oh, I see you're sad, let me, let me sit with you, or I'll read you a story, or tell me about it, you know? So it's when we didn't have that holding, that attunement, as it's called, or we didn't have an adult to regulate our own emotional state as a child, is we bury that emotion and we don't really learn how to deal with it. So one of the ways, probably the most important way to prevent addiction, is to uh, inform parents, teach parents, guide parents, create environments for parents to really attune to their children give the attention to the children they need, allow the children to feel their emotions and saying, not saying, don't cry, it's okay. Instead say, oh, you're sad, I'm just going to be with you, you know? Not try to suppress our emotions, but allow them to be as they are as our children, as children, and have an adult there that helps us to regulate our emotions because they're regulating their own emotions without suppressing them. That's what we need. Because that emotional suppression is, is likely the first step with addiction. The second thing that, that happens in childhood is we learn to choose between attachment to our parents or authenticity. So somewhere along the line, and maybe you know when this happened for you, when we were kids, we learned that we were more acceptable to our parents if we were either good, perfect, nice, uh, smart, funny, pretty, beautiful. How many recognize some of those? And that's who we became. So we thought we had to be the nice girl, the A student, the high achiever, uh, the funny one, because that's how we got the attention. So we, we put on the, this clothing of a coping mechanism as a child that we start to believe it's who we are and we get recognition from it. And people tell us that's who we are. Oh, she's the smart one, she's the pretty one, she's the um, adventurous one, she's the rebel, you know? And unfortunately, we become what people tell us we are. Is that true? We become what people tell us we are as kids. So if someone tells us we're stupid, we become the stupid one, we think we're stupid. So it's really important when working with addiction that we reframe our identity and that we also create words for ourselves that reflect our true identity instead of words that um, confirm a false identity that we took on as a child that's really the veil or the cloak that separates us from our true self. So in the first part of the Beyond Addiction program, Module 1, the theme is, I'm a spiritual being having a human life. 
And one of the techniques we do in that uh, module is we ask people to create something called the best future self. And it's important that this best future self is not informed by your ego, but by your soul, by your intuition. Just as a seed grows into a tree and blossoms and bears fruit, each of us, when we come into this world, has a, an emanation of our highest potential that's possible. We could call that our destiny, we could call it our higher self, but something that we were meant to be. How many of you feel that? That you know what you were meant to be when you in this world? You have a picture of that in your head. Just raise your hands if that's true for you. So somewhere along the line, you have a semblance or an inkling of this is whom I'm meant to be. And it may come to you in a dream. It may come to you when you meditate. It may come to you um, because other people can see that in you. And they tell you, hey, I really see you can be a great teacher or a great leader or whatever. And so it's important for us to reinforce that identity rather than the identity of the addict, because we're not an addict. The finite self has a behavior pattern of addiction. It doesn't mean we're an addict. It's just it's a behavior pattern, but it's not who we are. So we really want to separate who you are from your behavior and recognize the difference and confirm and exalt the true identity. So I'm going to lead you through this little exercise of the best future self and ordinarily people would write it down. If you have a pen and paper, you can write it down. Otherwise, you just do it in your head. So first of all, connect with the breath. Connect either at the heart or between the brows. Bring your attention to one of those areas. And ask yourself, what did I come to this world to be? What's my highest projection, my highest incarnation in this lifetime. What does that look like, feel like? Usually what this is, is a combination of you utilizing the talents you've been given, the gifts, so get a sense of what are your gifts? What do you do really well? And it's something that makes you feel very happy and fulfilled. And it gives you a great deal of meaning. And it's contributing to the we. It's contributing to the greater good. So let's say you're fully, this is fully active three years from now. Take yourself to three years from now and you're this. So I'm going to ask you and see this in your mind's eye. What are you doing? Where are you and what are you doing? What's this fulfilling life that you have? What does it look like? How are you different physically? Is there anything different about the way you project yourself, either the way you dress, the way your hair is, your fitness level? Where are you living? What's your living environment? How do you spend your free time? What pleasurable, meaningful activities, social activities do you participate in in your free time? How do you take care of your body? What's your relationship like with your physical body?
And what are the primary relationships in your life? And how do you nurture those relationships? Who are you with? What gets you up in the morning? What gets you excited? And now take a few more seconds just to really feel that, see it within, and confirm it with your own words, in your own mind saying, I am, I'm doing this, I look like this. Sit in the posture of this new person. Feel it in your whole body. Now inhale deep and exhale. When you're ready, open your eyes. And I'd like you to imagine that it's three years from now and we've all, we're all re right now having a reunion in the same place. And I'd like you, if you feel comfortable, to turn to the person next to you and say a few words describing your best future self using the words, I am. So you're using present moment tense. Can we do that? Just say a few words to the person next to you using the words I am. Say only what you're comfortable sharing, but as though it already is what it is. And if you're uncomfortable sharing, then just stay focused on that vision inside yourself. Okay, now take a deep breath in and out and just thank your neighbor. Thanks for participating in that. So what happens, what happens when you share that with somebody and they hear you? What happens? It feels like it could be true. Yeah, you're sharing something very deep and someone's listening and it feels like it can be true. It's more easy to make that happen when you're supported. Now, what if we all knew this about one another for the next three years? What if we all knew this about one another? And, this is, and we were all holding that intention for one another, that I see you this way. I see you this way. I feel you this way. I know this is who you're becoming. Wouldn't that be amazing? And we all supported one another in that? That would be totally amazing. We'd have a, we'd have a whole new world if we could do that. So we would really do become what others project onto us. And part of what we need to do is share ourselves, this kind of thing, who we want to be, with people who can hold this for us, who can hold the space and remind us of this. And we also need to see it in one another, even if we're not sharing it, you know? So no matter how troubled somebody is or how destitute somebody is or how crazy somebody seems to be, if we can see this seed that wants to germinate in them, and see that in them, then it will help them to become that. I'm, uh, I have fruit trees at home, and uh, it's, a real, it's a real job trying to get the fruit to uh, be produced without scabs and mm, fungus and all that stuff. So every, everything needs to be nurtured. We need to nurture one another to become these beings that we're meant to be. So if we had an environment as children where, where nothing was nurtured, then how can we expect to do that, right? So uh, another little example is I went to travel to China for two years in a row. And the Chinese people, if you've gone to China, they have such a sense of reverence for teachers and elders. And I was uh, treated in China, especially the first time I visited there, with such respect that my own self-esteem went up like five notches, you know, just because of the respect that was given to me in China. And I, I so recognized the power we have 
in changing people just by how we see them. You know, it's how we see them. So if we see somebody yesterday when we had the group, the circle, or the day before, maybe it was the day before when Durga Lili was saying the circle, and each person, many, many people said, um, I'm an alcoholic or I'm an addict as we went around the circle. And then the next sentence was, I've been 25 years sober. And my response to that was, was kind of like surprise because I didn't see them then as an addict if they were 25 years sober. So the, the question also came up in Scott's class yesterday, how could we introduce ourselves differently? And I'm not saying that anyone should, and I know that there is a tremendous benefit, benefit on some level from, from admit, admitting that one is a, an addict or an alcoholic. But from this first module, it would be something like, I'm a spiritual being who has used alcohol to deal with pain. You know, so that the primary identity is a spiritual being. That's where we have to get to. We have to get to the, the, who we really are as the spiritual being rather than the behavior. And Yogi Bhajan delivered a really powerful lecture about this once. I'm going to read a quote in a minute. But he said that every identity we have, whether I say I'm a teacher, whether I say I'm a Canadian, I'm a woman, I'm a mother, I'm a, a wife, he called, or whether I say I'm helpless or I'm gifted, he said all of those, no matter if they're positive or negative, are complexes. Complexes. So similarly, identifying as an addict, he would say, is a complex. And he said all of that is, is, is not real, you know, because the only thing that's real is I'm a soul, I'm a spirit. That's the only thing that ever lasts. We die. He says what, what happens... What dies is your complexes, but your spirit doesn't die. So who are you? You're not the complex, you know? And somebody asked him, well, what do we do about that? How do we get rid of them? And he said, make one big complex. I am the grace of God. I am the will of God. I am God. <laughs> or whatever works for you, you know? So we have to be careful of identifying with any kind of complex. Any attachment to any identity is false other than if you want to call it higher consciousness or the true self or your soul, that's the only thing that's really real and everything emanates from that. And we can be caught in difficult behaviors that are, um, but is that what we really want to emphasize? So I think the more opportunities we have to see this true self and this embodiment of higher consciousness as something like the best future self, and the more we make that our reality, our go-to, the better. So what we do in this module one of the Beyond Addiction program, we ask people to kind of recite two or three sentences describing their best future self when they go to bed at night and when they wake up in the morning. They just remember it. Until after a while, this best future self is sitting on your shoulder talking to you and informing your behavior. And there's a very good author named Mark Lewis who wrote a couple books. One was called Memoir Memoirs of the Addicted Brain. The other one was called The Biology of Desire. Both of them are great books. And something he said is to overcome addiction, first of all, all addictions are, are um, relayed in the brain through the same circuit. And you can call it the brain reward pathway. Some people call it that. Or some people call it the motivational circuit. And the theme behind it is seeking. It's really seeking. What are you seeking? That's a word I love to use with addiction. So are you seeking food to cause because you're hungry? Are you seeking sex because you want to reproduce? Are you seeking um, chocolate because you want a temporary feeling of upliftment? Are you seeking alcohol because you want to numb your pain? Or are you seeking marijuana because you want to be calm? You know, we're always seeking something. And so we need to turn that seeking either into God, it's really, or unconditional love, whatever, whatever version of that you identify with, and union with the self, which is the purpose of yoga. Either we turn that seeking into yoga of seeking union with the God-self within, 
or we turn and or we turn that seeking into some goal that we're passionate about that's bigger than the comfort of the addiction but you got to direct it it's, we have to direct it somewhere it's a motivational circuit so where are you directing your motivation is it temporary relief in the sugar or the alcohol or the tobacco or the marijuana it's just temporary mo- relief or can you create something bigger, like this best future self that inspires you, that you have passion for, uh, that can override that other seeking? Because we have to direct that seeking somewhere. Or do you direct it into spirituality, spiritual practice with devotion? But it has to be directed. And so addiction programs will fall short unless we direct that seeking into something that inspires the person and as a place they can put their passion and their energy. And so we, we, we keep that best future self alive through the whole Beyond Addiction program until usually by the end of the program people have manifested much of it. And uh, it's a great tool, it's a great um, skill. And um, in one of the other modules of the Beyond Addiction program we have uh, the, one of the module is I create my habits. My habits create me. I choose habits that support my divinity. Isn't that powerful? I create my habits. My habits create me. I choose habits that support my divinity. I've been so inspired by the habits here. You know, satsang in the morning, satsang in, satsang in the evening, uh, meals twice a day, yoga twice a day beautiful habits that totally support one's divinity. If we choose those habits and do them every day, we're going to make marked progress in terms of manifesting that union with the divine within ourselves. If we don't choose those habits or we only choose them once a month or once a week, it's going to be a slower process. So we need to figure out who do I want to become and what are the habits that are going to take me there? What are the daily habits? How do I get up in the morning? How do I go to bed at night? What kind of exercise do I do? How do I eat? What do I eat? What do I need to study? If I want to be a musician, I have to practice every day. If I want to be a gardener, I need to garden. You know what I mean? So once you have your your motivational goal and what you want to achieve based on your destiny, based on what your soul is telling you, then it's looking at, okay, what are the habits I need? And those habits then will come from a place of devotion and hopefully and self-love uh, and discipline so that we can achieve eventually what we set out to do. And there's a meditation Yogi Bhajan gave that we'll get do now to break any addictive habit. And in terms of looking at this motivational circuit in the brain, it, uh, it starts with an area sort of in the central part of the brain just below the pineal beneath the pineal gland called the ventral tegmental area or the VTA so every addictive thought dopamine is released from that ventral tegmental area and then it goes to another place a little bit further forward called the nucleus accumbens and then it goes to the frontal lobe and we either say yes or no to that addictive thought based on the control mechanisms or the activity in the frontal lobe. But Yogi Bhajan said, before we knew this motivational circuit, he said it in the um, early 80s, maybe 1982. He said, there's this place just underneath the pineal gland that can be reset with this particular meditation to break all addictions. And the beauty of this meditation is you only need to do it for about five to seven minutes. So let's do it. So the pads of your thumbs go into this little um, hollow behind the corner of your eye. About one inch from the corner of your eye, there's a little depression in your temple. So place the pads of your thumbs firmly in that depression in your temples. The fingers are in a light fist. Close your eyes and focus them between the brows. And press your back molars together. And you'll be pressing and relaxing your back teeth, your back molars. Like, uh, I'm going to use my hands as though they're my, they're my molars, okay? Your back teeth. Press, relax. Press, relax. Your back, back teeth. Press, relax. Press, relax. Both sides simultaneously. Press them, 
relax. Press them, relax. When you relax them, don't pull the teeth apart. Just relax the pressure. We got that? Okay, so you have firm pressure on your temples. Your eyes are looking between your brows. You're pressing and relaxing the back molars. Now we're going to combine it with a mantra that you'll do silently in your mind, which is sa ta na ma it means birth life death rebirth so each time you press the back molars repeat one of those syllables so that i'll just do it out loud for a moment and then we'll i'll do it silently for a few minutes so every time i say one sound you're going to press and then you release before the next sound sa ta na ma sa ta na ma sa ta na ma sa ta na ma keep going repeating silently so this is adjusting the area of the brain responsible for the first impulse of addiction. Breaking the cycle. Do it one more minute. Now inhale deep through the nose and exhale, relax your arms down. So the recommended time is between five and seven minutes. You can do it longer, but at least five to seven minutes. And it's not the most fun meditation. <laughs> so it does bring it does stir up some emotion and uh and that's part of the healing. So just be witness to what it stirs up without uh breaking the meditation. So every addiction or most addictions also are related to trauma, which means that something happened to us when we were children that should not have happened, like abuse or witnessing violence, or something happened to us, something didn't happen to us that should have happened, like care and attention. So when we recognize that addiction stems from trauma, then we have to ask ourselves, how do you heal trauma? And that's a difficult one. Trauma can be healed primarily by coming back into the present moment. So any techniques that we do that bring people in the present and into the body are helpful techniques to heal trauma. So that means we pay attention to what we're feeling in the body, and Scott talked a lot about this yesterday. We, we do yoga, we move, we pay, pay attention to the movement, we pay, pay attention to the breath, we use mindfulness and pay attention to what we see, what we smell. We bring our awareness to the present moment. So that's an important part of any recovery program, is just more awareness of the present moment. Also, one of the areas of the brain that has diminished activity, both in addiction and trauma, is this frontal lobe, which helps us link with our values, link with moral behavior, link with ethics, link with um, planning, with visionary ability. So that frontal lobe tends to be offline a little bit if we've suffered from trauma. So people who have been traumatized, their lives are constricted or contracted and they have trouble moving forward. So we need many, many different um, skills really to help people recover from trauma. Tomorrow I'll be teaching a yoga set for the frontal lobe of the brain. So that's one way, one of the things we do in Kundalini Yoga. And also just mantra, chanting mantra and, and being aware of while you're chanting mantra, the movement of the tongue, hearing the mantra, being aware of the meaning of the mantra helps to uh, bring back online the frontal lobe of the brain. So it's very healing for trauma is simply chanting mantra. And chanting mantra also helps us to you know, if you chant mantra for a while, some of those old feelings will come up and you meet it with mantra. So it helps cleanse the subconscious of whatever was going on in us as a child that, that maybe caused us to become, to rely on addiction for relief. 
So I think um, in the next couple of minutes, what I want to do is, is actually chant a mantra <laughs> that we use in Kundalini Yoga. And one of the other themes in one of the modules is, um, is I choose Dharma over Karma. That's another theme in one of the Beyond Addiction modules. The theme in the last modules is in serving others, I serve myself, my higher self, and the greater good. So eventually, it all comes down to service, and I think we all know that, that the, uh, the road to recovery ends in service. You know, After we work through our own healing, the journey is to serve others. So this last uh, meditation helps us to clear karma. It uses the mantra Wahe Guru, which in the Sikh tradition means the experience of ecstatic wisdom. It's also a mantra that uh, brings together Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in those two words. And the movement will be like this. So you have your hands um, parallel to the floor, the forearms like this. And the movement's going to be Wahe Guru, Wahe Guru, Wahe Guru. Wahe Geo, and Geo means soul. So you're talking to your soul, you're saying, I'm experiencing ecstatic wisdom, oh my soul, with this mantra. Uh, do I have an iPod? I think. So this is really clearing. It helps to cleanse the past, clear your karma. So choose something that you want to throw behind you. It could be trauma. It could be negativity of some sort. It could be past actions that you'd rather not remember. And we'll use this mantra to kind of release it and bless it and release it. And the hands have to go back behind your ears. That's what cleanses the karma. Back, both of them simultaneously behind your ears.
now inhale and bring the hands behind your head, behind your ears, as though you're dropping something behind you. Suspend the breath and release from your hands and hold it posture. Hold the posture. Exhale through the nose. We're going to do it two more times. Inhale deeply. Suspend the breath. Stretch your hands all the way back behind your ears. This is what helps to clear. Hold. Bless it, say goodbye. Exhale through the nose, and now one more time. Inhale deep, keep your arms back, behind your ears, let it go. And exhale, relax your arms down, and just sit in stillness for a moment. And connect to that vision of yourself, an emanation, a pure emanation of your soul, free, clear, shining, using your gifts, living a fulfilling, meaningful life. Deeply inhale and exhale. Thank you all. Satnam, Om Namah Shivaya.